Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we are talking about Hooked by Near AL, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. This is all about the things that we use, the whether that be a physical product uh, or some software or some kind of platform we're using uh, that really get us hooked. You know, we, we get sucked into them, we start using them and all of a sudden we're just... We're just deep, deep in that rabbit hole, just playing Angry Birds or Candy Crush. Or there are obviously a few nefarious examples, but how you can build a product that hooks people in? It's one of those things. Once you learn the tricks, you can use it for good, or you can use it for evil. And I'd say so far, in most examples that come straight to my head, it's uh, typically used for evil. <laughs> If you look at some of the stats that he's got here, and this is from 2014, he says 79% of smartphone owners check their device within 15 minutes of waking every morning. There was another study showing that in 2011, people check their phone 34 times a day. And in 2014, it's up to 150 checks per day. Yeah, so that's when the book the book was written five years ago. We've got some updated stats here that you found, Jones, man. One of these studies says that on average, people are using their phone two hours and 51 minutes per day. That's a big, big, big chunk of your day. That's almost one-eighth of your day, including sleep. So, you're probably looking at, <laughs> it's almost a quarter of your waking that's, hours, that's isn't a, it? That's a hell of a lot. And then people on average touch their phones 2,617 times a day. And the top 10% of heavy users are five and a half thousand times per day they're touching their Oof. phone. That's um, a lot of touches. So we are hooked, including me and you. We've checked our stats yeah. and it's not amazing either. You yeah. can check it on your iPhone if you're listening now. I do recommend it. But that's all we're going to face it. We're hooked. And this is what the book's all about. It's figuring out you know, how we got to this place that we are now. It was only just before the iPhone. You know, It's almost impossible to remember what life was like before mm. these devices came in. Yeah, most certainly. And the big thing that they do in able to hook us is they form habits. So a habit by definition, you know, cognitive psychologists define a habit as these automatic behaviors triggered by situational cues, often things that we have little or no conscious thought over. So something happens around us or within us, that's the the trigger, and then this automatic behavior, this habit takes place. And so what the best, most addictive products do is they form habits within us that make us keep going back and keep using them so regularly so from the business's point of view habits have a huge roi if you get someone hooked to whatever your device is and again you can be using this for the 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 good habits that you want to instill in people or the bad ones but it actually increases the customer lifetime value if you think of like a credit card if a credit card company can build some kind of gamification in or some kind of you know the reward system point system that make it into a habit obviously it's better for them if you stick with them they're going to make more money out of you as a a customer lifetime value than if you just use it every so often if they can make it habit forming so that you use your credit card regularly and you stick with this one credit card company they're going to make a shitload of money out of you you can also offer a price flexibility if you hooked then they can easily raise prices. So Warren Buffett said, you can determine the strength of a business over time by the amount of agony they go through in raising their prices. So if they can raise prices easily, then you know they're a strong business. Yeah, if you think of Candy Crush, which was uh, massive, I myself fell deep into that Candy Crush vortex. At first, it's free and it's fun and you're learning how to play and it's all good, but then every... So often, uh, after you've sort of established yourself a bit, they'll prompt you to maybe spend a 99 cents and you can <laughs> buy some extra little help that sort of uh, propels you further in the game. And they've worked out that, you know, if you've spent enough time and it's formed a habit, they have this price flexibility. They can keep upping the amount that you spend up to the point where they were raking in over a million dollars every single day from people buying, you know, 99 cents, Jesus. $2.99 little boosters and... It's a, it's a yeah, pretty I spent, serious... I spent some money on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty serious because the one that got me was Habbo Hotel. So, me and a mate, we started playing and, you know, at the start, it was just stuffing around. Then over time, we probably both were hooked. And so, you you know, the, the, your success in this game is by how good your hotel room looks and you can visit other people's hotel rooms and everything. I've never heard of this. And, um, yeah, I used to play. My hotel room was all right and I was really <laughs> competing with him. Then one day, I went into his room and it was the most... It was the most jacked up room on the whole hotel <laughs> out of all the other people who jump in, flat screen TVs and all these beautiful carpets and everything. I'm like, mate, how'd you do this? And he goes, oh, yeah, no, just through skill, through skill. 
It was only recently he disclosed that he uh, he actually spent some big bucks <laughs> <laughs> getting the points to actually do it. So that's how they do it, right? They start with freemium and then and then they get the suckers in to start paying. Mate, that is so funny. Uh, I've never heard of it, but uh, I feel like that's. I'm glad I didn't because I probably would have got sucked in. <laughs> Uh, another big reason that it's good for businesses is obviously it sharpens their competitive edge. Once you've formed a habit around a company or a product and once you've somewhat you know, become addicted, once you've become hooked, it's going to be very hard for a new product to come along and sort of shake you free. Once you're entrenched in something, something has to be exceptionally better. Like we talked about in zero to one, if something comes along that's marginally better, if you're already hooked into something, you're not going to change. So obviously, it's a massive benefit to a business if they can hook you in uh, and it's going to really stave off the competition. Definitely better products don't always win. I've been tossing up with um, changing our website away from WordPress down to Squarespace. But on WordPress, we've got so much baggage on there and other apps and plugins and all this kind of stuff. It's going to be too difficult to move anywhere for just only marginal improvements. Mm, We're hooked. We're hooked. And so obviously, as... Obviously, these habit-forming things are phenomenal for business. So, if you're in business, it's obviously advantageous to try and hook people in. So, he's got a four-step hook model that he goes through in in the rest of the book. And the first step of the hook model is the trigger. So, this trigger, it's like the actuator of behavior. He says it's like the spark plug in the engine. There's internal triggers and there's external triggers. And obviously, whatever uh, service or product you're offering, it needs to have some kind of trigger to prompt someone to do something. The next part we'll be covering is all about the action. So following the trigger, it becomes some kind of behavior in anticipation of the reward. So if it's something like your iPhone, it's actually just clicking on the interesting picture in the news feed or something along those lines. Third phase is variable reward. So vanilla feedback loops where you do an action and you get a reward, they're pretty boring, but actually variable rewards where sometimes you get big wins, sometimes you get small wins, variable rewards are what really hook you in. And the fourth step is investment and that's having the person invest in some way into whatever your product might be. So they're the four steps. We're going to kick it off with the first one, triggers. So triggers, obviously, as we said, that's the thing that prompts you to do something. And the first major one where all of these new products or new services will start off is with external triggers. So there needs to be something out there that prompts you to do something and at the start it becomes from something outside of you. It's some kind of call to action, some kind of uh, sensory stimuli, something around us that says, hey, you should take this action. You You should do this behavior. So there's a few different types of external triggers. You can have paid triggers. So, you know, your Facebook paid advertising to get in front of people. You can have earned triggers like earned media. So you're on the top of Google. You have relationship triggers and that's where people might spread your the idea of your product through word of mouth or you might have owned triggers so it might be an app icon on the home screen or anything like that the thing that all these four have in common it's really just finding ways to really get other people's attention in the first case about your product so of course the external triggers are the first step this is the first point of call where you're going to get things uh, zapping at you trying to trigger you trying to grab your attention into doing something And external triggers are great and obviously they're important at the start. But what any successful company does is they eventually turn these triggers into internal triggers. So rather than them having to constantly buy ads or uh, constantly work on their SEO to bump themselves up their search results, these internal triggers, if they can get you to think in your own mind to do something, then they're onto an absolute winner. So when the product becomes tightly entwined with your pre-existing routine, it really can start leveraging your internal triggers. So it, the most powerful internal triggers come from our emotions and particularly the negative ones that we're trying to get rid of. So it might be feelings of boredom, loneliness, frustration, confusion, indecisiveness. These really have this slight pain that you might have. So you know, if it's loneliness, this might be that trigger that, that pushes you to you know, open up LinkedIn or Facebook to see if you've got a notification sitting there. So it goes into a bit of a case study as to how we all got hooked on Instagram. Obviously, Instagram, very, very popular, very successful. And he talks about all the different types of triggers that come with Instagram that got people hooked. So firstly, it might be a friend taking a picture of you. They share it on their Instagram account and they try to tag you, but they can't find you. So there's like a relationship trigger there where they're telling you to create your own account. As sort of the app gets more and more popular 
Apple starts to notice it. There's an earned trigger where Apple puts it high up ranking and or you know one of its featured apps or you know the New York Times writes a big article about uh, Instagram and how popular it's getting. And then the owned trigger comes from once you've got that app on your phone, they've got that screen real estate. They can put the little number there as to how many notifications you've got. Anytime there's a like or a comment or a new photo, they're, they're able to give you a notification. So that's the owned trigger there once you've already got it. And then after all this happens and once you're sucked in, the internal triggers come up. That's when you start feeling lonely and you might check on Instagram if anyone's liked your post or maybe you're feeling bored so you just scroll through the feed and all these internal triggers start to work their way into your brain. So that's the first step in the process. It's having those triggers to, uh, to, to reel you in like a little, little gullible fish <laughs> for the slaughter. So the second step here in this process is all about action. So what the trigger does at this point, it informs the user of what you need to do next. But if the user doesn't take action, then the trigger is useless. So action's a form of behavior and he leans on a bit of serious research here, you know, the, the, the framework of BMAT to show if someone's actually going to perform a behavior or not. If you want to initiate an action, doing has to actually be easier than thinking. And he leans on the work of BJ Fogg, who runs a persuasive technology lab at Stanford University. If you look at any of the massive platforms or uh, networks out there in the world, you'll probably see a graduate of BJ Fogg somewhere high up in the chain. And he said B equals MAT. So behavior is like a function of motivation, ability, and trigger. So obviously, if we want to do anything, we need to be motivated to do it. We have to have the ability to it. And then, of course, there's the, the trigger that we've already spoken about. And so say, for example, you get a phone call, but you don't answer the phone. So you miss that behavior. A few reasons you might not answer the phone could be firstly, the motivation's not there. Perhaps you thought it was like a telemarketer or a debt collector or someone you didn't want to talk to. You don't have the motivation to answer, so you just let it go to voicemail. Secondly, maybe there's, you didn't have the ability. Maybe it was stuck at the bottom of your handbag uh, underneath a whole bunch of stuff and jumpers and you couldn't get to it in time. So you didn't have the ability to take that call. Or perhaps the trigger was missing. If you had it on silent, you didn't know it was ringing, so you missed that phone call. So, of course, you need to have all of these things there in order for, for someone to take action and do the behavior that you want them to do. The second element to create action is it needs to have serious elements of simplicity. So, big BJ Fogg here, he had another bit of, bit of juice. He says there's six elements to simplicity. So, it needs to be simple in terms of time, how long it takes to complete the action, money, how much it costs, the effort exerted, the amount of mental effort in system two, if you listen back to that episode, and social deviance, and also non-routine, how much is it disrupting the way you, you do things normally? So obviously, you need to be making things as simple as possible. So you need to make it you know, either as short in time as possible or as cheap as possible or as effortless as possible in order to make something, uh, in order for someone to take that action. So like one example that apps or other programs use is they allow you to log in with Facebook. So Facebook sort of has their API which allows other platforms to use Facebook as a way to log in. So obviously if you want to make a new account on something, you might have to go through two pages worth of stuff. You've got to put in your personal details, your email address. You have to um, then go through and verify your email. You've got to click on the link. There's all these steps that make it really, really hard to create a new account. Uh, but of course, if there's the simplicity of just logging with Facebook, if you can click that button, it takes all your details of Facebook to verify who you are. That's super, super simple. So for somebody to make it easy to create an account, they've just saved a lot of time and effort. You're probably much more likely to take that action and create that new account. Yeah, other other areas is pops up on the internet. If if you might be reading a blog post and then there's this easy, simple button to go share on Twitter, you're much more likely to just do that action from that trigger if if it's so simple as it is on some websites. I mean, not every tech company gets this right. I feel like Microsoft do a really poor job of this. <laughs> every time I go in to try and sign in on something, it's, you know, it's, it's a password that I forgot from a long time ago, then it's a real goose chase to reset the password and, and get back into that. Um, but yeah, Microsoft has done a good job, so yeah. I probably shouldn't judge. <laughs> they must have done something right along the way. Uh, so they're sort of the first two ways to prompt action. So firstly, obviously, you need the motivation, ability, and the trigger. It needs to be simple. And then the third way for driving action that a lot of these big successful things that get you hooked in is 
playing on these heuristics and cognitive biases. So obviously, having just done Thinking Fast and Slow, the big two-part episode that we did, a lot of people are playing on some of these cognitive biases. They've learned the ropes. Like one is like the scarcity effect. So we know that you know, we know that if something's scarce and valuable and we feel like we could miss out, it's going to prompt us into action. So that's why like Amazon on their listing, it'll say, you know, only 14 left in stock. So you know that there's scarcity there. There's a very limited uh, amount of items that there could possibly be. So you're not going to wait till tomorrow. You're just going to buy it right now. Yeah, the godfather, Shialdini, who we got to speak to on the podcast, is the really the master of this uh, in his book, Influence and uh, Persuasion. So, you know, other areas this might pop up is the endowed progress effect. So, if you've got your car wash or your coffee rewards card, if they give you two stamps to kick you off, then you've already got a bit of momentum and you're much likely to go back to them and to get those uh, the, the final stamps to get the free coffee. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. They had like... Some people were given a card that required eight visits and some people were given a card that required 10 visits, but they'd already stamped the first two. So in both cases, you needed eight more things to get your award, but they found that the ones that had 10 holes that had already stamped two of them, they actually had an 82% higher completion rate, which is pretty phenomenal for like a pretty simple trick. Just, yeah, if you hand out rewards cards, give them a stamp or two, they might come back. Yeah, LinkedIn use it as well when they give you percentage completion of your profile. So they'll show you, look, you've already done 50% of your profile. And, you know, just inherently, you you just feel like you have to get that to 100%. Are you on 100%? Uh, I'm not sure. I know our, we use Active Campaign for our email list and we're sitting on 83% completion and we have been for the last two years. So maybe we'll just tick those final <laughs> boxes off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. So first was triggers. Then we got them to action now, third way to get them hooked is variable reward. So earlier we were talking about BJ Hogg and this Fog. time... <laughs> BJ Fogg. Fog. BJ yeah. Fogg. This time we got BF Skinner. I don't know if they're actual names, just the two 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 letters, but... I think if you're a scientist, just initializing your first two is probably better than giving your first name. It, it adds just, a lot of weight. Yeah. I think he's uh, pulling from the authority badge <laughs> from Big Cialdini and Influence. But Skinner, anyway, Skinner was before Cialdini. I think. Yeah? He's an old... Old timer, but old timer. Yeah. Anyway, but what Skinner did a study on is they did a pigeon experiment where they had two sample groups of pigeons. So the first group, they were in a box, and every time they pressed a the lever, they got a pallet. So the pigeons learned that a clear cause and effect, and they press this, get some food. Now the second group, which is quite interesting, they were in the same box, but what they did is they added a lot more variability to the lever. So every time they pressed the lever it didn't come out necessarily and sometimes it did and sometimes it didn't. And what this variable research showed was the pigeons in the second group who had the variable reward where there's a lot more uncertainty into it were much more addicted and much and pressed the lever much more times, even more than the food that they actually required. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty crazy that they ate more food just because there was variable reward as opposed to the ones that I suppose they knew that there's always going to be food there whenever they press it, the food's there. So that's just the idea that these variable rewards that the apps use on us get us hooked in. So, you know, obviously, if sometimes you log into Facebook, there's no notifications. Sometimes you log in, there's one or two, and then you log in one time, and there's 14. And then next time you log in, there's six. That's the variable rewards that they're using against you to get you hooked in. Man, it's been a while since I've had 14 notifications. You're getting pretty popular. No, nah, I just don't check often, mate. <laughs> so the reward in a lot of the time in social media like this is this connection to the to the tribe you know you go on and you feel like you're being endorsed by someone else or one of your peers another way that we're rewarded is going on the hunt so if you think like old hunter gatherers or we used to be we'd have to go out there and find our food and you know on the variable day that would kill the walrus and have a big meal <laughs> that's you know unpredictable and then we get our endorphin rush machine gambling is a similar thing when you're, you're, you're playing away at the pokey machines you're on the hunts for your resources and every now and then with the variable rewards, you'll get the, the free games. Yeah, pokies use this to absolute perfection. They're raking in a billion dollars per day from American gamblers in slot machines. That's massive. So there's those rewards of the tribe, the rewards of the hunt, and there's also the rewards of the self. So this sort of ties into the book Drive by Dan Pink that talks about you know this intrinsic motivation being massive. Like We like to feel like we're pursuing tasks. We like to feel like we're improving at things. We like to feel like we can get to the end of something. 
and sort of, you know, achieve that win. These are all like rewards of the self. Yeah, we have an intrinsic motivation sometimes to complete things. Mac is, monopol- Mac is Monopoly's back out in Australia at the moment. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who, who are getting a few of the, you know, the, the, almost the Mayfair. If you get Mayfair, you're probably going to go out and buy a whole bunch of more Macs <laughs> to get, make sure you get Park Lane as well. <laughs> Mate, it's a, I don't really, I reckon I've eaten Macs probably three times in two years. Now, I'm almost like I want to go and get it just to play the Monopoly. Yeah. I saw on a billboard, it said there's, there are 69 million prizes. There's like a, a show's got a population of like 23 off 24. It says there's more prizes than Aussies. Mm. I thought you're almost guaranteed to win, aren't you? Yeah, if you go you are. grab a couple of cheeseburgers. You're going to be net positive ROI. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's pushing it. I'm Maybe not that, sure. That's probably pushing it. So it was trigger, action, variable reward. Now the fourth step finally is investment. So obviously triggers is very important to make you take action, which is very important. Then giving your rewards is very important. But what really gets you hooked in is this investment. Any company can come along and pay a lot of money to get you to do something. But what truly makes you hooked is this investment period. And the big thing that investment does is that it changes your attitude towards something. And again, there's a bunch of irrationality that comes into play here. One big study is these origami frogs. What people did was they came in and folded up their little bits of paper to make an origami frog. And then after they'd made it, they had to uh, give a bid as a cent value as to how much they'd buy it for. You know, 10 cents, 20 cents, 23 cents, 35 cents, whatever it was. And then a random number between 1 and 100 would be drawn. If the bid, if your bid was higher than the random number, you had to pay that much to buy the, uh, the frog. Or if the number was higher, then you'd lost your creation. And so what there was, there was three groups. There was The first group was the people who made the frog and then bid on their own frog. The second group was just an onlooker who bid on some random person's frog that they made. And then the third group was a random onlooker who was buying a professionally made, you know, from this Japanese expert origami frog. Now, group three, the expert ones, the average bid was 28 cents. Uh, group one, the people who made their own frog and were going to bid on their own frog was 25 cents. And then group two, which was the people bidding on just a random person making a frog, their average bid was four cents. So there's a 6x difference there between you know somebody looking and buying a shitty looking origami frog at four cents compared to the person who made the shitty looking origami frog. They're willing to pay six times more, you know, 25 cents to get their origami. Yeah, Dan Ariely calls this the IKEA effect. It's the idea if you just go to a furniture store and buy it ready made and put it in your house, you're not going to value it anywhere near as much as say this desk where yeah. we're co- recording on right now where I got you involved because I'm, I'm quite hopeless with putting <laughs> things together. And yeah, we put this to- we put this together. If we didn't make this, I'd, I'd say this is worth 20 bucks. Because we made it, I'd say it's at least worth a couple of hundred bucks. <laughs> but that's the Ikea effect. There is that Ikea effect. Because you've invested some kind of time or effort or energy into something, you value it far higher than, than you probably should. So what the companies want to do, they want you to invest in any way in their product and CL Denny called this the foot in the door technique where you know if you just do a tiny investment, you're going to irrationally try and be consistent with your previous behaviors. So if you've done a small investment, you're more likely to do much more of a bigger investment. And this is what they did with researchers who asked a whole bunch of res- residents to put a sign on their property saying drive carefully. So one group they actually asked to start with stickers and most people when they had to just start with stickers, they'd say, yes, no problem, it's just a sticker. But then later they asked that same group, can you put the big sign up now? So that was one group. The other group they just started and they went straight for the big guns and asked them to put a sign up straight away. They found the people who started with a sticker had 76% compliance, which is ridiculous because the group who were asked from the very start, they only had 17% compliance. So well, that's a factor of five difference just by starting with the sticker yeah. with a long-term goal of, of going the big sign. That's pretty crazy. If like you know, only 17% of people were willing to put this big sign up, but all it took was to put this tiny little sticker on your window to 5x your results, that's crazy. That's that... You know, that foot in the door, the commitment and consistency. Once you've taken some small amount of action, you're much more likely to repeat that action later. So what this comes down to is kind of a positive feedback loop. The more users invest time and effort into your product or service, the more that they're actually going to value the product and service. Take Spotify, for example. Obviously, they've got a a whole bunch of music that's out there. And if you use Spotify 
it actually gets better. As in Spotify, I was actually I was actually very surprised. I never really listened to music that much, but I started using Spotify, and the the stuff that the algorithm comes up with as like recommendations is actually pretty mind blowing. Uh, and so obviously, the more you use it, you know, if you heart stuff, if you skip stuff, the things you listen to, the things you block, Spotify is learning all of this, and the more you use it, the better their recommendations actually become. It's a similar thing with LinkedIn. Once you've put all your information and your life skills and everything like that and ends up being your resume, you feel like and more compelled to use it more and more likely to post things because you've invested your time into it already. Yeah, I think once you're already in there and you're already using it, obviously you become invested in it and you're going to use it more and more. Like say Twitter, he also says that the more you use it as a uh, creator, obviously if you're getting more and more followers and more and more people reading your stuff, then that's a positive for you by investing the time to create stuff and attract followers, you're going to stick around and use it more. But also as like a user, like a consumer of Twitter, if you're sort of curating your feed, you're following the people you want to follow and you're seeing the types of things you want to see and you're enjoying using it, the more time you've invested into crafting that, the more likely you are to keep using Twitter. So that's the book. Over the last 11 years, we've really we really have become hooked on a mm-hmm. lot of these habit-forming products and it has rewired our brains and the, the, the way we live our lives. And Big Near, he... He did used to work in Silicon Valley for some of these tech giants and he has really unveiled the, the secrets that they've used to, to, to smack to to hook us. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. These four steps. So once you get you have a trigger, an action, a variable reward, an investment, these things that happen without us even realizing and we're getting hooked. And sort of from here, the, this book is five years old. Nia, he's actually just done a new book called Indistractable, which is kind of like how do you fight back against uh, these things that have hooked us in. How do we take back our time and how do we take back our attention? And so we're going to speak to the big Nia all about his new book, Indistractable. 